Hello everybody, this is Jack Dennis and welcome to our fly fishing and tying channel. I hope you're all having a good start to the new year and out tying a lot of flies. Uh, we started uh, a couple weeks ago with our Jack Dennis and Friends fly tying session. Uh, our first one was with uh, Dave Allison and I'm going to be showing you some from the past. One of the things I've been involved with uh, my fly tying career is setting up fly tying theaters and been involved with the many conclaves that fly fishing groups and clubs have over the country. And they uh, really highlight tires that you may not have ever met. And one of the best ones is one in Idaho, both the Western Idaho Expo and the uh, Eastern Idaho Expo, which is in Idaho Falls. Uh, they've been doing these fly tying get togethers for a long time. We're talking over 30 years. So I want to do some highlights from some that I filmed in 2009 and 2010. And you will get a chance to meet some names you know, and some, maybe some names you didn't know. And one of the nice things about tying at these expos is all the uh, excitement and sounds of people going around telling lots and lots of fly fishing stories. Most of them may be exaggerated. But one of the nice things about the theater is you get a chance to listen to the tires talk about it, their experiences uh, and, and answer questions. I, I think you're going to enjoy them. Uh, we're going to start this uh, week with uh, uh, several. Uh, we'll try to give you the most information. And I know some of you are going to say, wow, you know, I don't know about the materials. Well, these are really uncut. So, you know, you do your best on figuring it out. But I think you're going to enjoy the interaction uh, with the crowd and with the tires. And really, uncut un and, I think, extremely fun. Let's get going. Our next tire is Bob Jacklin, and he is uh, a legend, a fly fishing legend and a legendary fly tire. His shop in West Yellowstone is known the world wide as one of the expert places to get information on fishing Montana and, of course, Yellowstone Park. You'll enjoy Bob's stories along with his tying, as he's one of the most entertaining fly fishing personalities you'll ever meet. And so it's on to Bob Jacklin, and I hope you get a chance to visit his shop in West Yellowstone or get one of his books if you're heading to Montana or fishing West Yellowstone. The next one I'm going to do is going to be the giant salmon fly nymph. I like that fly, and just now, I'm, just this year, I'm doing it on smaller size. Remember that nymph has a three-year life cycle, so it's in the water from an egg all the way through its stages until it gets to be a full size, about three inches long. Somebody had them at the show this morning, had a bottle of them. They collect them out on the river here. Okay, we're going to do a big giant stonefly, or nymph, the giant stonefly, and I'm going to do a big one. Let's do a number four. I'm going to do a big one so you can see it. I like this fly, but I like it even better on a smaller size now, which I haven't really had a chance to use much. But, but that's a number four. This is a number eight. Same fly now. That's the eight. So that's the fly we're tying, and I'll, I'll cover it with you. Lee Wolf helped me design this fly, even though he died long before I made the fly. His thought was, when he tied a nymph, especially the last time I fished with him, he was tying his nymph on a plastic tubing and he put it in a pin, and he was tying his nymph on this plastic tubing. And then he took the pin out, and when he got fishing, he took his tippet, threaded it through the nymph, tied a little hook on, and brought it back in the end of the nymph. But the nymph would give, see? It was on tubing. So his thought was, and he told me this, that if a trout grabs a nymph, he'll grab it and he'll let go and grab it again. If the, the fly gives a little, so it looks like it's edible. You all watch the picture on television of the guys of these bass fishermen, and they do the commercials with the rubber, rubber worm or plastic worm, whatever it is. And on television, you see the bass look at this rubber worm. 
The bass runs over and he grabs that rubber worm and spits it out. Guess what he does? He grabs it again. That's the theory I'm working on. When they grab this fly, because it's rubber, it gives a little, and my thought is they'll hang on a little bit more. They grab a stone, they spit it right out. Fish grab stones all day long in the river. Anything floating down, they grab. But they spit it right out. But when they grab something and they gives, they'll keep. So here's the fly. I'm going to put some lead wire on this. Or you can use imitation lead. I happen to have lead with me. And we're going to put a 20 thousandths lead wire, one long wrap around the whole shank, and then we're going to go back on itself a little bit. So I want this weighted really well. I don't like to use split shot, whether I'm trout fishing or steelhead or what. I don't like to use split shot. Um, but I will if I have to, because you've got to get the fly down. So sometimes you have no choice. I was steelhead fishing last weekend with my friend Tyler here, and I did something. I experimented the whole weekend, tried different things. I even fished two flies at once. It didn't work for me, but I tried it. <clears throat> but one thing I did experiment on that seemed to work is I took these sliding bullet weights that they sell for the bass fishermen, and I'm able to buy them on 164th ounce. I sell them in the store, real little. Pyramid. What I did is I tied my steelhead fly, but before I put the fly on, I put one of these weights on my leader. Then it slid right down over my fly. That got the fly right down. I have to use two, I used two of those weights, but I got the fly right on the bottom where I wanted it, and I hooked two steelhead for the weekend, so that was good. I only landed one, but I hooked two. All right, we're gonna put some thread on here, and I always run my thread through my ribbing and through my weight. That way I got it secured. Normally when you teach fly tying, you always put a layer of thread first. But when it comes to weight, I put my weight first, then my thread, just because it's quicker. And we're going to cement that in pretty good. Now we're going to put a tail, and i got to find my material. Here we are. I'm lucking out. Sometimes I can't find it. I'm lucking out here today. We need some wool yarn, the secret stuff, natural black neck. I'm going to get all that out of there. Natural black neck, bicycle tire tube. Bicycle tire tube, some black biots, goose biots, and some March brown dubbing, just some heavy dubbing. And one last thing, a little scud back black. I think that's everything. Okay. Nope, I've got to find my dubbing. So anyway, talking about Louie and Joe again, I bought a lot of stuff from those guys. They had pure beaver, and I was able to buy, still have some black left, pure beaver. The other thing I got from them, nobody has but me, very interesting, I got translucent white Australian opossum. When you dub this on, you can see through it. Very interesting uh, hair, very interesting stuff for dubbing. So I use all that to make my own dubbing. All right, we're gonna put a little beaver fur, black beaver. Black is the hardest color to dye. I dye a lot of my own color, especially the olives, but I can't dye black. I'm not good enough, don't know how to do it. And you really gotta have some hot, and you gotta have a little sulfuric acid to do black. Other than that, you really do very well with a local writ dye. All right, we're going to put a little bit of ball of dubbing just on that and bring it up a little, just so I could tie my two biots in here for my tails on my big stonefly nymph. There's a biot. Move this out of the way. This is nice having this camera here. I can see what I'm doing. See that? I can see my own mistakes. See? All right. I'm going to put a little tail on one side. And by the way, these goose biots we buy for how much is this? No price. They sell for two or three dollars for a dozen of them. Louie and Joe tried to sell me a, a bale of these. A bale is four feet by four feet by four feet. Bale of these things for about twenty-five dollars. Billions of them. I couldn't, I had no place to put them. I didn't buy them. Now I kick myself I didn't buy that bale. It would last you for a million years, you know. But I didn't buy them. What am I going to do with a bale big as this table of these biots, all white, you know? Now, here's a secret ingredient. Bicycle tire tube. Very important. I tried automobile tire. It was too heavy. didn't work. So I bought bicycle tire tubes. And you want to use a racing bike, kind of a, uh, a bike that's used in the, in the roads. And we taper it with a long... This scissor doesn't work very well. You need a long scissor. Anyway, we taper it a little bit and we cut it into strips. See if I can cut it, this scissor doesn't, you need a nice long sharp scissor. There we go, good. Here's the taper I got. This is bicycle tire tube now that you know blew out from somebody, I go to the bike stores and they give me the old ones they have around. 
You got to wash the heck out of this after you cut it open because it has talc. But I put it on top, upside down, and I tie it right tight, right to my tail. Now I got that in there. This is the big, this is the number four. This is the big Turinarsis. Then we're going to take some black wool yarn. You can use any yarn you have, but I prefer using wool when I can. So I put a little more cement on the fly. I'm a cement believer. And put this yarn right up, all the way back. And then I wind it up again and build an underbody so again it would be soft when that trout grabs that black rubber and it's on that wool to begin with, it's gonna give. This fly is gonna munch a little bit. And the trout might just grab it twice or at least hang on to it long enough that you can detect the strike and stick them. One time after Lee, Lee Wolf died, I was guiding Joan Wolf and her son and um, son Doug. And during the day, Doug looked at me, and he was about 17 at the time, and he said, how many fish would Lee catch if he was with us today? And I, I thought pretty quick, and I thought the right answer. Lee would catch his share. He would outfish everybody necessarily, but he would get his share. If you're all catching fish, he'd catch them. Nobody catching fish, he probably wouldn't get them either. So he was an interesting guy. Now we're going to take this, we're going to stretch this, and we're going to overlap as we stretch a little bit. We're going to overlap this to create a perfect segmentation body of that great big Turinarsis nymph that's found in our waters here. And then we're going to wrap about three wraps. Helen Shaw, the great lady fly tire, always said three wraps is all you need. In 1968, I got the pleasure of tying. Well, it wasn't really a frail pleasure. I was a little scared. I tied the first time that every, I was the first guy to ever tie at a conclave. And at the last minute, they asked me to tie some flies, Virginia Busek and Helen Shaw, the great fly tire. So I didn't think anything of it. I grabbed my material. I was 22 years old. And I'm tying flies, and people are photographing me. And all of a sudden, these two ladies come sit right next to me. And I realize it's Helen Shaw, the top tire in the world, sitting next to me watching my mistakes, see? I was pretty nervous at 22 years old trying to tie a fly. Anyway, we got the fly tied now. Now we're going to put on some scud back. So Helen Shaw is a neat lady. She just passed on a year ago last December. She was in her 90s. And I sent some books to her a few years ago, and she made a nice little inscription in her book and, and autographed them for me. Anyway, we're going to put some scud back, black, quarter inch, right on top. We're going to put it right back to where we want our wing case to start, right there. It looks about right, about, about two-thirds of the way up, not a little more than half. Now, along with that, we're going to put a piece of the bicycle tire tube again. And we're going to go ahead and cut about a quarter of an inch straight. This little scissor doesn't do a very good job. You need a, uh, you need a long, at home I got a couple of long scissors. But we're going to go ahead and try it. Okay. Got a piece about a quarter of an inch of this bicycle tire tube. We're going to lay that up front on top. Upside down, it has a little curve to it, so you want to go upside down, stretch it, and bring it back to right where you're starting the wing case. Over where I'm tying booth, uh, um, what is it, table number seven, I'll be tying later, uh, I have one that's done with the legs. I'm not using legs anymore. For the ones I fish, I use hackle, I'll tell you why. I use natural black hackle only. I don't use any dyed hackle, try not to. And I want a real webby, oh, that's perfect. Again, Whiting Farms can make as webby a hackle as you want. This is called American Grade Hackle, very webby. Natural black. If you're looking around the show here, some of the guys selling hackle, you might just grab a barrel and look what he has. You might just see a natural black. If you do, buy it. It's only three, 15, 10 bucks, something like that. But when this is wet, natural black, when it's in the water and wet, it's not black, it's bronze and it looks like it belongs in the stream. Natural, and also the webbiest stuff you can get, real stuff you throw away. I wanna bring that out, and that's gonna be my legs. This is really a neat way to fish. Gonna tie that underneath, about three or four wraps, put a little cement on it, and we're gonna dub the heck out of this now. Same color dubbing, March Brown dubbing. We're gonna dub this well. Again, Gretchen mentioned using some wax. You gotta have a little wax when you're dubbing. All right, we're going to put a little of this cement on here. I'm going to tie a rusty spinner for you, 
my last fly. The next one's going to be a big salmon fly dry. So we got the nymph, and then we're going to have the dry, and then we're going to have a rusty spinner. I catch a lot of fish on these rusty spinners. All right, we got some dubbing on there. We're going to dub it on once and behind the leg, behind the wing, and come around again with the legs. Put a little more dubbing. I want a lot of dubbing on here. This is Australian opossum dubbing. We're going to put that dubbing on there and build it up. I put a little wax on my fingertips so I can dub better. Somebody noticed, they said, what you're doing is waxing your dubbing. I guess I am. But I put it on and I can get a little tighter dubbing here doing that. All right, we got it right in the thorax area. I'm going to put a little more on yet. I want a little more on there. I'll tell you why I put so much on. I'm going to pull this, brush this out. So I want plenty on there so I can brush it out and it looks good. This one should be about right. Oh, yeah. That's what I want. Now I bring the thread right to the eye of the hook. And the first thing I put on is my legs. You know, a stonefly has six legs. I put a hackle on there, I got about 600 legs. Is that better than six? I don't know. But we're going to wrap it around. And you may have too, mu too much legs, so you can cut a few off if you want. Sometimes I cut some off, sometimes I don't. Put it on there, tie it off. Got it. And now the, you want the legs coming out on the side of the nymph. So you brush it off, get it like coming out. Underneath, maybe you want to take a couple and cut it off. You know, just cut a few down. Maybe up top here a couple. Got it where I want it. Now what I'm going to bring is my, my piece of bicycle tire tube right over the front. Right over the front, stretch it a little, and I want to tie it right to the eye of the hook. And I mean right to the eye. Stretch it and tie it in nice and tight right on that eye. That's what I want, right on the eye of the hook. Good. I'm going to reposition the hook in the vise now, down lower in this regal vise so I can really pull on it. Bring that over and stretch that. That's my body stretch black. That gets tied in too, real tight. At least three wraps, Helen Shaw. Three wraps. Good. She also said to me that if a, if a piece of feather or a piece of material goes that way, you can't make it go this way with all the thread in the world. You got to use it according to the way the material is. You got a hackle that looks like that, you got to use it that way. Now what we're going to do is going to build a head on this fly again, just like I did the March Brown. Okay. Going to build a nice little head. We're going to put a little wax on so it'll grab that grab that thread. This is a pre-wax thread by the way, but I like to add a little more wax on it. This is a great thread. I love it. It's 140 denier, or denier, in the right term, and it's a very good thread to fish, to uh, cast with, or um, tie with. It's very strong, so it does a nice job. Clean my legs out and put a nice, nice head right in there, right where it belongs. That looks pretty good. Maybe I'll go ahead. I got a little more dubbing. Give it a little more, a little more head on it there. Just makes the fly look a little more natural. Bring the thread back. Now we're going to push that over the head again, hold it, stretch it a little bit, tie it once, twice. The third time we pull and push down with my thumbnail. I got a nice looking head. I'm going to go ahead and do a whip finish right on there. About three or four wraps. That's all you need. Pull that through. We got it. That's done. Pull this up. Flat. That's done. Reposition the hook and advice. Now I'm ready for the last step. Those legs look good. Now those legs are larger than normal. A normal hackle you'd put on would be shorter. These legs are long, okay? That's what I want. When that gets wet and it's floating down the river, dead drift, those legs are going to be doing this. They're alive, and it looks alive. So now the first thing we're going to do is get my dubbing brush. Get my dubbing brush. We're going to pull out that dubbing. I like these regal vices because they hold the hook every time. You don't have to play with them. You put it where you want it, and you got it. Now, see what I did? I pulled out those gill plates underneath that thorax throat area, and it looks like it really belongs there. I'll put that on a hook, and you can take a look at this fly. I'm going to save all these flies for the, uh, for the club down here that are going to probably do something with them. And uh, Jack Dennis wants us to make sure that we... And he's a great guy who wants to make sure that we show the fly off a little bit before we pass it around. That way we can take pictures. Thin body, look at the, look at the, uh, you know, the back portion of this. Okay, we got the thorax area. 
that bottom area. It looks like it just belongs right there.